to you. And a good evening to all of you book this lovers here. This meeting is being recorded. And a good evening to all of you book lovers here. Welcome. Without much ado, let me introduce Kaveri Madhavan, author of the book we are reading this month, The Tainted. She has written two other books. And uh, Kaveri, first of all, Kaveri has a long lineage of soldiers in her family. Her maternal grand uncle from World War I, her father, her paternal uncle, and her maternal uncle all served in the Indian Army. And it is but in order that her first award-winning book should be should revolve around the army. She already did her schooling all over India. Her graduation from Stella Maris at Chennai, post-graduation from Bombay, and MBA from Ireland, doing brilliantly all the while. A keen sportswoman, she has excelled at basketball, sailing, and skiing. She was a copywriter for a while at Chennai, Marriage saw her following her heart and her only husband overseas. First to the UK and eventually to Ireland, where she has lived over 33 years with her husband and three children, who are all, who are all incidentally, all of them are doctors. And I think her, her son is, children in laws are also going to be doctors. She lives in Ireland with her mother, Bollu Guru Swami. But deep in her heart, Kaveri is a true blue kurg, a farmer. She lives on the outskirts of Dublin on a five acre land where at various times she has had, she has grown a flower garden, vegetable garden, a fruit orchard, macronutrients. She has a piggery, a poultry, a horse, some cat, some couple of dogs, and sometimes uh, some rabbits also. She has dabbled with writing since long, first as a travelogue writer for local papers, and then two books earlier. Now with her children all grown up, she has found time to pursue her indulge in a passion of being a full-time writer. The Tainted won her a prize in, the Europe, in Europe in the category of military novels. Travels, golf, writing, keep her busy. Happy writing to you, Kaveri. Looking forward to your new book. Before I hand you over to Banu, one simple question. Kaveri, how excited are you to have us at this book reading? Our first, and I hope it's your first in India. I know you have read books all over, but this is your first in India. Tell us how excited you are at this. Well, you know, to be, to be uh, talking to a book club from India, being introduced by my aunt, I mean, it's just so amazing. Thank you so much, Iranti, for such a generous um, introduction. Uh, as you know, with all the truth, imagine, truth is easy, it comes easy. <laughs> so, uh, no, I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. And um, sh should I wait for Banu to maybe uh, say a bit, or will I? Will I? Banu, yes, Banu. I, I have. Let me welcome you. Thank you, Sita, for that introduction. A very hearty welcome, Kaveri. What a privilege it is for us to have you here. And it's the first time ever that an author has joined us for a discussion. And needless to say, we are super excited, Ka. Now, Kaveri Madhavan's book, The Tainted, is in the genre of historical fiction. And it's about the Anglo-Indian heritage. Anglo-Indians seem like a vanished race today, but how much a part of our childhood they were, weren't they? We had Anglo-Indian friends, we had Anglo-Indian teachers, and we loved and admired their easy, carefree Bindas nature, envied their freedom going off to dances with their boyfriends and girlfriends wearing their flouncy frocks. And, uh, you know, and we, we didn't really think of them as uh, a very privileged lot. I mean, I always thought they were a very privileged lot. Apparently not. As a mixed race, they were neither here nor there, looked down upon the, by the British as inferiors and likewise by the Indians as not wholly one of them. Let me quote one of the principal characters in the novel, uh, a girl called Me Tume. Uh, Kaveri, how do you pronounce it? Tume or Tume? Tume. 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 Okay. So she, this is a quote. We are tainted. We were never white enough then, and we will never be brown enough now. 
That's the conundrum that Kaveli Madhavan explores in her lushly imagined novel. For all those members here who have not read the book, let me just give a kind of a brief synopsis or a background to it. The story is set in two parts. About two, and it's a story about two families, the Aylmers and the Tumis. Spanning about 60 years, it's a saga over 60 years and several generations. Part one begins in British India in 1920 in a little cantonment town in South India called Nandagiri, where Colonel Aylmer, the Irishman, leads a small group of Irish soldiers as part of the British garrison stationed there. Among them is a young soldier, Michael Flaherty. He's a sensitive young man who falls in love with Rose, who's Mrs. Aylmer's uh, maid in waiting. However, there's a, there's a little romance that develops between both of them, but however, that budding romance is punctured by news of the atrocities between the Irish and the British back home in Ireland. That sets in motion a series of events in Nandagiri as well that may, raises many questions regarding identity, color, race, and the notion of home. Then part two, cut to the 1980s. It's an independent India now, for over three decades free of the British clutch, clutches, titled quite intriguingly, The Sitar Guitar Girl. The setting is once again Nandagiri, which has now evolved as a little town. The story builds up very nicely from here on because it's the descendants of those same Anglo Indians we read about in the earlier part, part one. They now carry the narrative forward with interesting little anecdotes, very believable characters, unexpected incidents and clever little twists that make for the most engrossing reading, believe me. The author weaves in so much of history of both Ireland and India in those times. The Irish-English mutiny of the 1920s in Ireland, then she, our own history at that point of time, the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, Gandhi and the freedom movement, and then India's independence in 1947. All of this figures in this novel. And uh, so it's all in all, I would say it's a brilliant marriage of facts and fiction. Now, I'm not going to be a spoiler and divulge anything more. That's for you readers to find out. But enough it is to say that it is copiously researched, beautifully researched, deeply engaging, and it's a well-crafted love story. That's a pure pleasure from first word to the last. So, Kav, I'm going to call you Kav, okay? That's what everyone says, right? You're known as Kav. Yes, yes, yes. Now, let me uh, set you off with our first volley. What inspired you to write this book? Is it the fact that you lived in Ireland or that you knew Anglo-Indians? What, what, what was it? What really got, yeah, got you uh, uh, started on this book? Tell us all about it. Thank you so much, Banu. It is such a, uh, you know, yourself and see that uh, my aunt gave gave me and the book such a wonderful and generous introduction. Um, but before I answer that question as to what inspired me to write this book, uh, I just want to give everybody who is here today a very, very brief uh, you know, background into the connections between India and Ireland. So, you know, Irishmen have been coming to India um, for ever since the British arrived, you know, with the East India Company. And um, the, the connections between India and Ireland are little known, uh, but they are very, very strong, very, very strong. So it was a tradition in Ireland for, uh, you know, the, the second, sometimes the third, fourth, fifth sons, you know, who had no chance of inheriting anything from their parents uh, in Ireland to try and make their fortune uh, out in the colonies. And, um, you know, from the late 17th century onwards, um, the the British as an empire, they had uh, three cities in Ireland were examination centers for the civil service, um, you know, and so Irishmen sat for the civil service exams, passed and went out to India for the last 300, so, you know, for over 300 years, they, they have been doing that. Wow. So it's, it's not really well known, but, um, you know, our Irish people, men and women, they were very, very much part of the, the whole, the cog, you know, that, that turned the, the empire, kept the empire going. Now, most often they were not the top rung, 
so they wouldn't have been, uh, you know, the, the very senior people, but they were definitely the second, third and fourth rung. So, you know, Irishmen ran the telegraphs, they ran the postal service, they, they were in, you know, they were magistrates in the, in the smaller towns. Um, they were pl plantation, you know, they, they managed huge plantations, uh, poppy fields. I mean, Irish people have been there side by side with the Brits. Um, you know, in, in the colonization effort. And this is quite peculiar because at the same time, Ireland herself, you know, was trying to fight off the, the, the yoke of uh, British dominance and, and um, you know, uh, being part of, of, um, of the empire themselves. So it, it was a very peculiar situation for Irish people at that time. You know, they were, they were colonized themselves and they were also actively part of the colonizing British in India. So, uh, you know, coming back to your, so th that's, that's the background, you know, and, and of course in our own lifetime, lots of us, you know, studied with Irish nuns and Irish priests. So, you know, that, that link with education has stayed on even after, in, after independence. Uh, and today, uh, you know, there are thousands, I mean, literally thousands of Irish, I mean, sorry, of Indian youngsters coming out to Ireland to study in the universities. And colleges in Ireland and are really doing well for themselves. So that's my little brief, brief background on the connection between, uh, you know, the old connection between India and Ireland. It's not recent, it's very, very old and very, very important. So coming to your question, Banu, about what inspired me to write this book, I was actually at a function in an Indian embassy, in the Indian embassy in Dublin, when somebody very casually said, I overheard a conversation actually about how the Indian flag was inspired by the Irish flag. And you know, I was very intrigued and uh, sort of joined in the conversation and then found out that there was a regiment called the, the Connacht Rangers who had come out to India several times in their in their 300 year history. They've, they've been in India several times. But when they were there in the 1920s, they mutinied. And the reason for the mutiny was because of what the Brits were doing to Ireland in Ireland. And, a lot of the Catholic soldiers in the, in the regiment felt very aggrieved at what at what was going on in uh, in uh, Irish towns and villages, and um, you know they just decided to mutiny. And apparently, I mean the the story is that they bought pieces of silk, you know, orange, green, and saffron. Uh, sorry, saffron, white, and uh, green silk in the in the local bazaar. And um, and stitched it together, and you know the Union Jack was pulled down during the mutiny, and this Irish flag was raised. And uh, keeping in mind that this was soon after Jallianwala Bagh, the, this mutiny of the Connacht Rangers uh, happened in Punjab, and um, in a, in a small in a small hill station called Dakshai. So given given it was so soon after Jallianwala Bagh. Apparently, a, a few of the Indian, um, you know, freedom fighters saw this flag going up, and uh, apparently it was the inspiration for the, you know, the our colors. The colors of two flags was, are almost identical. It's just a, in the vertical and horizontal stripes. So I, after listening to this, I came home the very next day, and uh, you know, I, I finished my second book, manuscript had been sent off, and I decided to just look it up. You know, this is the early days of Googling nearly 20 years ago. I uh, looked it up and, and I knew straight away and immediately that there was a story to be told. Wow. So that's how I got writing it. That, that's fantastic. So your inspiration just came like that, looking at the flag that went up. And that's, that's a really interesting, car. So how long did it take you to write the book? You know, when did you say, yeah. when did you finish? Yeah, it took me many, many years. I mean, the, the actual, I, I didn't actually put pen to paper for a good few years, you know, for maybe three or four years, in fact. And I just got caught up in the research, got lost in the research, really. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm so glad that, that I did because, you know, once I'd done the research and, you know, I had a mental picture of what life was like in the 1920s, um, I was then able to, you know, I was able to then actually put the research, almost put the research to one side and then carry on just writing it. So the actual writing of the book possibly took me about three years, but the research uh, took me, you know, uh, I'd say uh, it was six years of research went into it. 
And wow. unfortunately for me, I, I had a I had a stroke in the middle of all this. So you know, the book actually took me a full 18 years from start to finish. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. So, but you know, I mean, sometimes things pan out like that and you know, you have no control. Um, but that's that's the story of the book. I, I hope my next book doesn't take me that long. I'll be dead and gone by then. <laughs> So then the research must have taken you, did you travel, uh, uh, meeting people, you know, everything, right? Uh, possibly. Yes, yes, yeah. I'm imagining you pouring through books and libraries and stuff like that. Yeah, so the main the main bit of research was, um, you see, what happened, Banu, was initially I, I had thought to myself that I would write the actual, I would just fictionalize the story of the, the actual mutiny of that actual regiment, the Connacht Rangers. But very quickly I realized that you know, a lot of the descendants of the Connacht Rangers, you know, the, I mean, not, not a lot, I mean, the, the Connacht Rangers have descendants, you know, and I could just be putting words in the mouth of, you know, of people who have living descendants and, uh, and, and, and you know, putting fictitious words into their mouth. So, uh, because, you know, the, any regiment has only one colonel, there's only one adjutant, and, uh, you know, there's only one chaplain. So I then decided, I decided to fictionalize regiment. And the minute I decided to fictionalize it, I, I thought, okay, if I'm going to fictionalize regiment, I may as well move the, the place of the mutiny. So I moved the whole action from Punjab to, to the Nilgiris because, you know, I just felt, okay, at least, you know, I, I'd, I'd be more familiar with it. And, uh, you know, I used the base, yeah, I used Madras as the base for the regiment and then, you know, took them up to the hills in Nilgiri. In the Nilgiri. So in terms of research, now I, I actually, um, you know, I trekked in in the in Kunu, in the Kunu region. So, though Nandagiri in the book is completely fictitious, but I based it very, very, very closely on Kunu. And oh, that's um, what we all thought. Yeah, we yeah, did. because a lot of people actually, I, and I wish I wish I'd actually put it into my maybe notes or something at the back of the book. Um, you know, the, at the end of the book to say that it is a fictitious town uh, village because a lot of people broke their heads looking for it on the map. Well, actually it was Kunu. Yeah, it was Kunu. Uh, That's true. Yeah. Uh, have you ever met any Anglo-Indians uh, who migrated to Ireland and, you know, uh, how do they view their Indian ancestry in the course of your research? I, yeah, I haven't met any Anglo-Indians in, in, um, in Ireland, but of course, you know, I grew up with so many Anglo-Indian friends, Anglo-Indian teachers, um, and, and other, you know, acquaintances out, out, outside of school as well. And, um, you know, research, I, I never intended to, this book was never meant to be about anglo Indians. It just happened by chance because when I started that chapter in, in the little regimental, um, you know, little regimental chapel um, where my, my hero, Michael Flaherty, is helping, helping out the priest the very first day, and, you know, I don't know where from, from my imagination, you know, the, the character of Rose Toomey just walked into the, into the chapel and, and um, you know, the, the whole book just took a, had a life of its own after that. I mean, I, I had literally, my, my story was not meant to be about Anglo-Indians at all. You know, I had no, no notion of it. But the minute I wrote her into the book, um, uh, the book just took off on a tangent. And then I actually realized very quickly uh, you know, while researching the history of Anglo-Indians, that they were not very different from the community of, of people who are known as Anglo-Irish. Okay. You know, the Anglo-Irish in Ireland and the Anglo-Indians in India had a very, very similar um, situation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So. Oh, that's good. Frankly, Carl, I always looked at our colonial rulers as just Englishmen, you know, Velakarans. Yeah. We have segmented Irish or English or Welsh or, you know, uh, which they probably were. And they were all serving the British Army, right? I mean, the British Crown. Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, I didn't know there were so many exclusive uh, Irish regiments in India. So uh, most uh, Anglo-Indians of Irish stock. Uh, I mean, it, would it be right to say that a lot, a majority of the Indians were of Irish stock or it's like... No, 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 not at all, not at all. I mean, they would be, it would be mixed, and I don't think anybody has ever done a, a kind of, a, you know, a, a head count of, or, you know, from a research point of view. Uh, suffice to say that, you know, though in India we've always clubbed all the British together under the one Angrezi umbrella, 
but actually they were, they were distinct groups. You know, they were Scots, they were Welsh, they were English, and they were Irish, and they were as different as uh, a Malayali would be from a Punjabi, yeah. you know, uh, that kind of difference. So, you know, I, I remember coming to Ireland and sort of making that mistake of clubbing everybody together and very quickly realizing, oh no, they're, they're completely they're different traditions and everything, you know. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Uh, so what also intrigues me is that the English and Irish were adversaries back home, right? The English were ruling the Irish. Yes, yeah, yeah. Then how did so many Irish agree to come to India to serve the crown when they themselves were fighting for independence? Yeah, and that's boils down purely to economics. You know, um, Ireland was a very, very poor country right through its history, you know, and uh, they were all their resources were plundered by the British, just like the British plundered India. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just meant that, um, you know, it just meant that if you were not, if you were not well off to start with, or even if you were sort of from a lower middle class Irish family, you had absolutely no chance of inheritance or of making any money or, you know, being able to farm or anything because everything went to the eldest son. So there was a lot of, you know, younger sons who, who made their way to India. And it was just a means to an end, Banu. I don't think at that time anybody thought, oh, you know, we are fighting for freedom and why are we going to India? Because, you know, I mean, it, that, those, those, um, a question of know, those questions never, never even came into people's heads, you know. I mean, they did for, they did for a few people because there was uh, unbelievably, um, a, there was a good few, a good handful of very very important uh, freedom fighters who were Irish, you know, freedom fighters in India who were Irish, or you know, who, who were part of the who were part of the the group that influenced Indian freedom fighters. You know, they were Irish, you know, from Annie Besant to uh, Margaret Cousins. I mean, there's so many. You know, I'm, I'm only mentioning two names, but there's several, several, several people. Coming to the actual book itself, tell us something about how you crafted the book. Did you have the plot first in mind and build your characters around it? Or it was the other way around? Or how did it evolve, really? I mean, if you can tell us quite briefly. So, Banu, I, I... The title, The Tainted. I'm sorry? And also something about the title, The Tainted. Why did you call it yeah, The okay. Tainted? Okay, so I, I'll actually start off with that with that question first. Uh, you know, the reason I picked the book, The Tainted, now some, I was actually at a conference in Chennai uh, just before COVID struck. And I met a really very, very interesting um, uh, professor of English uh, who is Anglo-Indian. And uh, you know, she, when she saw the book, she asked me, what's the book about? We were at a conference together, and, you know, a very casual question. She was sitting beside me and she asked me, what is the book about? And I said to her that you know, it's about Anglo-Indians and you know, about the Irish army in India. And she immediately said to me, oh, I take huge objection that you would call the book The Tainted. And so I gave her a copy of the book and I said, you know, I, I am really interested in you. Uh, you know, I would really love for you to read the book and then tell me what you think about the title. And she actually, when she finished the book, she I met her for lunch. It was a very, I was very nervous about meeting her at that time because, you know, the first Anglo-Indian to read this book. Uh, and she was a professor of English as well. So um, I, you know, I mean, she, she was full of praise for the book and she actually totally understood. She said, yes, I understand now why you call the book The Tainted. So The, the, the Tainted is not me saying Anglo-Indians are tainted. You know, it's, it's the book is the, the, the title, The Tainted, is, is how, is me saying how Anglo-Indians were perceived. Yeah. You know, that's how they were perceived, but not only Anglo-Indians, that's how, and your Irish people were also perceived in Ireland. They were, you know, they as a group were also considered to be tainted. So that's why I chose that title. And there's a third group of people in the book that, that um, you know, um, that I would have said were part of that tainted, and that's the Irish Catholic soldiers. Because, you know, Irish Catholic soldiers who served, served the British crown, they were ostracized in, our, in, in Ireland. No. Oh. You know, so in, in Irish eyes, any Catholic soldier who served the British Army was tainted as well. So, you know, I'm talking, so the book is about three groups of people, the Irish Catholic soldiers, um, uh, the Anglo-Indians and the, and the Anglo-Irish, all tainted by association and by blood. Okay, so, so the, the tainted really is kind of all this, all of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I totally get it. 
Okay. Uh, also, Kaveri, uh, in this book, in the two parts, one could yeah. discuss very typical systems of governance. See, the first part is very, very British. The British Raj. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very, uh, very uh, uh, well in that. Uh, you know, with all its Irish and English and uh, the Anglo characters. And then the second part is a very survive, it's very, it's very Indian. Our typical yeah. style, Indian style bureaucracy around the IAS officer, the collector of Nandagiri, the survival nature of the subjects. Yeah. One can see that uh, distinction in the governance. And there's a very telling quote by this IAS officer Mohan Kumar. I'll quote that. 35 years on, okay, this book is, uh, I mean, this part is set in 1982, so 35 years after yeah. you've been. 35 years on, and we still haven't been able to shake off that colonial mentality. And maybe we still haven't, I don't know, even after 75 years. Yeah. yeah. One questioning acceptance of any higher authority, the deference, the fatalistic acceptance that someone else knows what's better for them. So, you know, this uh, thing. So did, did you all, did, was that deliberate in your part to show the different kinds of, as you wrote? Uh, um, uh, yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm going to answer this question along with the question that you asked me previously, um, which I which I actually did, did not uh, did not get to, get to answer you. And that is, you know, I never set out any of my books. I've never set out, you know, with, with an agenda or, you know, it, it happens organically. And because I, I never know this, I, I only ever know what I'm going to write about, I never actually know the end of the story or even the middle of it. So, you know, I, I'd be one of the writers who write, as they call, it's called writing by headlight. So, you know, uh, when I, you know, like when you're driving a car, you know, your headlights will sort of illuminate, you know, the hundred yards, but then when you get to the hundred yards, the next hundred yards, you know. So I, I never really know where my book is going to take me. I just let, it's very character driven. I let the, I let the characters do the, do the walking and the talking in the book. Mm -hmm. And then what comes out of it is what comes out of it. So, I've, you know, this even the tapes, it was never written. Yeah, it was never written with any agenda. Mm -hmm. I, I have no social message, no nothing. You know, I was just telling a story. Um, that's just how it ended up. Wow. That's interesting how you let it in. You know? uh, then coming to the specific characters, Akka, uh, each one of the characters is so unique, so clearly fleshed out, showing the traits of their respective ethnicities, you know. Captain Aylmer, his total white blood, then the endearing uh, Sean. Sean is how we pronounce it, right? Yes. Yeah. Sean yeah. Me, uh, the Baconwala. Yeah. And his daughter Rose. They're all the tainted Angloists here. And then you have the young soldier, Michael Flaherty. One, uh, one does feel so sorry for the way his life ended, uh, leaving mm -hmm. his girlfriend to his mother. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, were all these uh, characters inspired by real life people or real life incidents, something you heard about? Or entirely out of figment of your imagination. How did you create these well, characters? I'd say uh, you know um, a mix of both, Banu, because um, you know in in researching the book, I read many, many like I'd say twenty to twenty five uh, diaries of soldiers of of young Irish nurses who went out. You know, female young female nurses who went out. There was there was a lot of them. There was a there was a whole. Um, there was a whole core of nurses and they were called uh, Princess Alexandra's nurses. And these were young women, you know, uh, of, of every, from, you know, from every part of, the, uh, of Britain uh, uh, you know, and Ireland as well. So there were Scots, Welsh as well, you know. And these were young women who, went, who came to India as nurses and you know, uh, midwives and they were sent off to, you know, like really remote places, you know, they went off to remote tea estates and, uh, you know, they, they kind of looked after looked after British women who were who were pregnant and you know like I mean the, their diaries are quite a quite a revelation so the, the book the characters in the book are kind of based some some of them are sort of parts of people I knew uh, for example Moh Mohan Kumar is would was I, I wrote Mohan Kumar as the person I wanted to fall in love with myself oh, you know because awesome. I, I just loved him I, I you know he's the kind of guy I would have you know, fallen head over heels in love with myself. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, so I, I guess most of the characters are a combination of my, of research, and then maybe the odd character might have been somebody I knew before, you know. Uh, particularly uh, Rose, you know, uh, such a sweet little girl she was, the Baconwala's daughter. I love the name. Yes, Bacon. yeah, yeah. yeah. 
and what they call a chichi girl is that what they refer to i mean the chichi is what the uh, irish refer to the anglo indians was that the term yeah, I mean, it wasn't just Irish. I mean, the whole British, the British establishment would have referred to them as that, you know, yeah. uh, you know. And I mean, this was worse derogatory, worse derogatory stuff that was used, uh, you know, when referring to Anglo Indians. And and I think that's what that's what the tragedy of um, of the you know the prejudice against Anglo Indians, uh, which thankfully is no longer doesn't anymore exist. Not there anymore. You know? and, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Rose in this, uh, I find that she writes her story in the form of a diary. Any particular reason? Oh, it was just a. a no, that was just a that was just a literary tool, you know, because I I wanted to be able to express her yeah. uh, her innermost feelings, and this was the easiest way. I mean, for me, I, I thought I it was a it was a handy way to do it. One does tend to open out. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That was a very nice. Uh, I think that was a good strategy in the book. Really appreciate it. Okay, and now the characters in part two, and basically they are the four main protagonists. So Richard yeah. Puma, and then Jerry and her sister May, made to me, and of course Mohan Kumar. So um, uh, here you describe me as a sitar guitar girl, which is very interesting. So how did you conceive that? You know, it reminds me of the term chatakari that we used to use. Yeah, yeah. So I think, I think, yeah, I think it was more because I felt that uh, you know that May was was the the, the best of India, yes. the best of India, you know, the best of yes. both the worlds. And uh, very Indian, and she was very West. Uh, yeah, and very interesting, Manu. I didn't pick the title of that section. Mm. You know, you know, the, the part two of the book is called the Sitar Guitar Girl. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't pick it. You know, I I'd written about it. It's 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 what it's how it's how Mohan describes her. Uh, you know, in the text, but it was my editor who said, I want to have that as the title of the section. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, my, my editor picked the title of the se section and the minute she said it, I said, oh God, yeah, this, it has to be this, you know. Yeah. Actually, I, yes, you're right. I think Mohan Kumar picks that title and then he finds it appropriate. Because yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, he came up with something and he was telling Richard yeah. that. That's right, yeah. The guitar, guitar girl is what struck something in him. And yeah. 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 Also, my favorite character is, I mean, one of my favorite characters in the book is the jolly uncle Ronnie, uh, who after many decades, at age 86, yes. yeah. man, you had uh, Anglo-Indians going away from India. You had this old man coming back in reverse migration, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Like a fish out of water and preferred to die in his Babka Raj. That must be such a rarity of sorts, you know, uh, Anglo-Indian coming back. So were there any real life incidents like this that you'd heard of? I mean, I'm sure it's very- it's Very few, very, very few. But you, the one the people that did come back, yeah, the people that did come back, came back when they were much older, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, definitely, uh, you know, uh, I've read several um, Anglo-Indian journals, which are which are alive and kicking even today, you know, there's, there's mm -hmm. um, you know, Anglo-Indian magazines. And, and in, in, I came across several examples in those, you know, people saying, you know, how they, they were going to go back and, uh, because they, you know, they'd had enough, and uh, and also the, you know, the the absolute delight where you know they might have spent, you know, a good part of their life hiding their origins, origins. and then you know you have their grandchildren proudly declaring that yeah. they were of mixed race, you know, when the the grandparents themselves would have hidden that for that their almost their entire lives, and yeah. you know how things turn around. Um, yeah. And uh, talking of migration, it wouldn't be out of place to discuss the way Anglos left in droves for Britain, Australia, and Canada, etc. after independence. There is a passage in the book that really intrigued me. Let me read it out. Our families yep. were the ones that got the ticket to leave India to migrate to the home country, you know. We fair skinned ones were given a chance, but the darkies were always left behind here. Darwin's theory of natural selection, Anglo Indian style. It's a very telling statement. Yeah. Your comments on that? Yeah, and that happened all the time, Banam. I mean, that is documented. It's documented in diaries and letters. It's documented in, in uh, you know, in uh, academic research that, mm -hmm. um, you know, anglo indian families in the, you know, early 1900s, right up to the 1960s, uh, you know, they would, they would save uh, money, 
you know, to send the fairest child would be sent abroad because that was the person who had the best chance of assimilating. Oh my God. Uh, and then, you know, whoever was sent would then, you know. The fair ones, fair ones went first yeah. and the dark ones went. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's so sad, but that's that's exactly what happened for many, many Anglians. Not all, but many, many. It's like the caste system and the color consciousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It seems to be universal. Anyway, now as an artist myself, uh, Kar, I was quite intrigued by that part about Richard Aylmer, this whole exercise of him coming to Nandagiri to determine the location of the watercolor paintings that his grandfather had done. Yeah, know, yeah. Hanging in the club walls. Again, is it real facts? Did you really come across what, you know, I, I can kind of imagine <laughs> old clubs, you know, British of the British large, what yeah. uh, you know, still preserved and so was there some, uh, some story behind it or that's also entirely fiction? No, that's completely out of my imagination. But having said that, you know, as I said to you earlier on, a lot of my research was, uh, you know, to do with reading uh, diaries and books, uh, the memoirs, uh, travel writing that was done, you know, by uh, by young soldiers. Uh, you know, don't forget, Banu, that at that time, you know, if you came out to India as a young officer, uh, it was actually quite a boring life. You know, I mean, you you had you had all the military, um, you know, your your sort of your. Um, your, your military your day your military day was over by eight o'clock in the morning because of the heat and then after that you did nothing till the, till the sun was nearly gone so you know, there was a lot of time spent doing nothing and boredom was a huge issue so a lot of young officers uh, they would they wrote extensive diaries they painted um Looking for you know, so yeah yeah so i mean i, I kind of I knew when I was creating uh, that character, you know, when I was creating Colonel Aylmer, I knew that I wasn't, I wasn't going to be saying anything uh, out of the ordinary, that he was, a, he was an artist, you know, and that he painted. Yeah. Uh, just to emphasize how much attention to detail you've given to events of those times, uh, let's talk about this environmental devastation of the Nilgiris, you know, it looks like it began even during British times. The wanton destruction yes. of forests cleared for tea plantations, the agri business by land grabbers and those hunting expeditions. You know, very graphic descriptions. I think uh, uh, Rajiv has a question about that. That kind of intrigued him, right, Rajiv? Would you yeah, like? Sure. Uh, 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 Kaveri, you know, uh, we were always taught by Irish nuns. Yes. And Irish fathers, and we were so unaware about the Irish involvement in India. And when I uh, got the book, I was in States, I couldn't get your book there. So I came to India, ordered on Amazon, and then I started reading the book. Thank I, you. I, I, am, I can't read Michael Flaherty and Tom Nolan going to the bazaars and the woman. I, I am not. As I went through the book, I started identifying uh, myself with them. Like you said, the, the day finished at 8 o'clock in the morning, and then yeah. nothing happened there. And I was a tea planter for quite some time. Yeah. And as a planter, we had the same life, you know, I mean, yes. and the yeah. same colonial, you know, what you have in the second part of the book, the colonial, uh, you know, the club, where yes. the bedras and, you know, all those things. And slowly I started getting interested and in identifying myself with those characters, started living, you know, it's such a vivid uh, description of the time, both the, the pre-independence and the post-independence. And when I got to the part of the shikar, the hunt, which was organized, that was awesome. Was, I was there, you know, I, I personally was there in the shikar and I could see the uh, tiger jumping on. I mean, how, how did that come to you? I mean, that such a vivid description. I mean, you have to, you have to write yeah. such a thing. Oh, yes, you're very, very kind. And thank you so much. I mean, I, and I really appreciate uh, you appreciating that, uh, Rajiv, because the tiger hunt scene, that chapter, uh, I actually stopped writing. Uh, I, I started stopped the chapter. I started the cha um, uh, sorry, can you hear me? I'm cross yeah, stop. Yeah, okay. So uh, I was just saying that I actually, when I started the chapter, within within two or three paragraphs, I actually stopped well, writing. I actually stopped writing. And I, uh, I took a six-month break just to research Shikar. 
So, you know, I reread all of Jim Corbett's books. I read many, many, many accounts of, uh, you know, of tiger hunts, not just in India, but also uh, in Malaysia and, you know, in, in, South, in Southeast Asia as well. And um, I used um, a lot of, uh, you know, pictorial references uh, of which there were there are several. There was, a, there's, there was a magazine that no longer exists. It was called the London Illustrated News. It was a weekly, it would have been like the, you know, like our Illustrated Weekly of India. Right. Uh, and they, they had like literally every, every issue had line, you know, line drawings. This is, be, be, this is before photography. So they would have had line drawings or paintings of shikars. And some of them are so, you know, if you look at them, the, the detail in it was quite extensive. So I literally, Rajiv, took six months off just to research the, the shikar. And then, and then only wrote it, you know, and I, I'm well, glad you, I'm really glad well you Well done research, it. you know, because it is so, so prominent that part of the book. I mean, of course, the other yeah. things, Man was already, I mean, we all have been discussing and it's so prominent. Just two things, you know, I would like to say before sure. uh, somebody else would like to say. And sorry, Banu, I'll just take a minute extra. No, no, please, please. I want you to know, ask. Uh, Raji, Raji, Rajiv, Rajiv, give me one second. Kaveri, in the same line, could you just tell them how you actually track to that part? And then I heard somewhere that you had you heard an animal roar behind you when you were tracking. Please, please tell them yeah, that part well, also, Kaveri. <laughs> Yeah, so you track the yeah, time that so, you actually track, track in the forest. In the yeah, days, I was actually tracking, um, yeah, I was tracking very close to, um, uh, oh, I forget the name of the forest now. Um, anyway, it was very close to Kunur, you know, in the, in the hills below Kunur. Mm -hmm. And I'd hired a guide for a week, and, you know, we, we had headed off into the forest, and we were, we were heading towards a, a wattle extraction unit and um, uh, sorry a bottle extraction kiln uh, in the middle of the forest really really deep into the forest and you know we, I kept hearing these these uh, very strange call and I, I you know the guy was about maybe you know a, a hundred meters ahead of me so I called after him and I said you know like what is that sound and he said oh don't worry it's just a panther <laughs> and I thought to myself and you're walking hundred yards ahead of me you should be right this way <laughs> so you've actually heard a roar <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, of course, he he, no. he reassured me immediately. He said they're the shyest of shy. You'll never see them. You know, if they hear you. The roar came they, in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I just you say something. before I close up. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, um, as I said, we studied in convents and we were uh, we were encouraged to read English literature, the yes. kind of Thomas Hardy and you know those kind of things and Shakespeare. Of course, we read a lot. Uh, I am basically a Hindi wala. You know, I, I do a lot of writing myself, uh, I, but I write yeah. poetry and I write in Hindi. Yes. Uh, when I came back to India, you know, I was a, we were, many of us here were NRIs uh, for many years. And when we came to India, I said, I will read only Hindi because that is yeah. what my mother tongue and I'd like to read only Hindi. And then slowly I started reading Indian writers writing in English, you know. Yes. And you were not on that list. <laughs> but you are now fixed on that list. And I would like to read every <laughs> thing which you have written, uh, Kaveri. I mean, it's very nice. You know, I, I have written a poetry out of your book. I will send you. It is in Hindi. Oh I will... my goodness. I'd love to read it, Rajiv. And you know, to, to tell you the, to to tell you the truth, us, yeah, to tell you the truth, my, my ambition, my, my dearest ambition would be for my book to be translated into Hindi. I can do that. I can start working yeah. on it. I, I would definitely like to work on it. That will be a very good this thing because I am already, um, I have started writing a book uh, on all the women in my life. You know, Okay. Okay. I am the only brother of three sisters. <laughs> my okay. wife has no brother. You know, the pets in the house were all females. And because <laughs> I had only sisters, I had a lot of girlfriends too. You know, so the life has yes, been full yeah. of women. So I started writing, but the translation in the in Hindi definitely is a very good idea. Yeah, and, uh, I, uh, we can talk offline, and I can start working sure. on. It. So sure, sure. The only thing Thank about you. poetry is I don't know how much of Hindi all of you can read and understand. 
uh, being from. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I mean, there's uh, you know, like there's such and such fantastic writing coming out in regional languages. It is unbelievable. Like you know, from Odia to Bengali to you know Marathi, Gujarati. Like I mean, India yeah. is just such a absolutely amazing, uh, you know, uh, sort of a source of creative. The last thing is, uh, uh, you can give my regards to your ambassador, His Excellency Indra Mani Pandey. Uh, he's, a, he's, he's been a friend of mine. Oh, okay, okay, I will. I'll definitely win. Yeah. The ambassador Saab, Salam. <laughs> he's a Hindi wala too, huh? remember that. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. You, you yeah. Akhilesh Mehra, Akhilesh Mehra, yeah. yeah. Akhilesh Mishra. Yes, Mishra, sorry, Mishra. Yeah. He, yeah. he was in Banaras Hindu University when I was there. Oh, okay. Yeah. So do do give our regards to him. I will. I will. Thank sure. you. That's all from my. But we can uh, take offline about the translation. Okay. Okay. It's a very good project, and I would really, very be keen to work on it. I can do a portion of it and send it to you, or you can ask somebody to read it and see whether it. Yeah. Uh, no. Sure. I I read Hindi myself, so there's no no issues, you know. Yeah. yeah. One, oh, I speak it. Yes. Okay. One. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Great. <laughs> okay. So to get back to the book, Kaviri. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Banu, one question. Kaviri, you've gotten a very nice Indian love triangle into the movie at the romance part. You made both the Irishman and the Indian fall in love with your me. Yes. How how how, how did that work out for you? How did that how did you do that? What made you do that? It was a very Indian triangle. Yeah, and I, I think that was to do uh Shirwanti with the fact that um you know there was there was this no um, you know, that Anglo-Indian women uh, wanted to get a good catch so that they could leave India. And that was so untrue. Uh, you know, that, that was such a fallacy. It might have been the case till maybe the, you know, the 1940s, even up to the 50s. But certainly, you know, in the 60s and 70s, you know, Anglo-Indians were, were sort of coming to grips themselves with uh, you know the, the situation that they found themselves in, and uh, you know to their incredible credit, um, you know the, the next generation of Anglo Indians have haven't any of that thing. So I, I just wanted to bring out that you know that aspect that uh, you know she wasn't enamored of Richard because he was white. You know, so that's the reason I, I wrote that uh, bit. Well, and having said nice. that, now back to Ban, back to Ban. And anybody else? Oh, I mean, okay, on that same uh, uh, love triangle thing, uh, you know, the romance uh, uh, depicted in the latter half between May and Mohan is, is very subtle, you know, when you talk about the romance and the, the yeah, yeah, very staid. But it's, uh, but whereas, you know, it's not as fierce and like steamier lovemaking descriptions in the first part. Uh, yes, where, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, well, occurrence. Was that deliberate, showing that the Velakarans as a very randy fellows and Indians very straight, conservative in their approach to romance and sex and stuff like that? I mean, did you uh, really uh, put it that way deliberately or, you know, what was the thought? No, definitely, uh, definitely uh, not uh, uh, deliberate, uh, Banu. This is just the way, you know, just no, the way I, the yeah, story panned out. But I think, um, I think it was because I... I actually loved Mohan Kumar so much myself that I couldn't imagine him doing anything ungentlemanly. Okay. You know, like he was, he, I wrote him as, as the guy that I would fancy. You know, so, you know. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm saying this only in retrospect, you know, I mean, it's not that I was, uh, it's not that as I was writing it, I was thinking, oh my God, I, I'll, I'll say this about him, I'll say that about him. No, not at all. It was only, it was only afterwards that I realized, oh my God, I actually wrote, I wrote a character, I wrote in a character and gave him all the things that I would fancy in a man. Ah. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> what did your husband say about that, yeah? that you you know you kind of figure perfect man what did your husband have to that's say that's good that's good for us actually ask him he's, he's sitting on the other side of his computer listening <laughs> <laughs> he's saying and you ended up with me he says and i ended up with lovely you. to hear that that's lovely to hear that you gave that competition <laughs> lovely and, uh, yeah any, any other questions anyone any of our book club members bandana you have something to ask right Bandana? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to corroborate what Kaveri is saying. 
um, I remember maybe in the late 60s, uh, no, it was uh, just about 71 when I joined the army and we were together with a number of people. That was the war when the Bangladesh war was going on. Yes. So a lot of people who came in as an emergency commission people. And, uh, you know, people who are doctors who were just recruited in to help. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So among them, there were two girls. They were Anglo Indians. One was Maureen something and one I don't remember. So I said, what do you do after your stint here is over? And uh, both of them said, you know, we are going to Australia. Uh, mm. We are fair. And so we've been accepted. And this was uh, 71, 72, I would say. Yes. So it was still going on. It didn't stop in the 60s. Mm. And yeah. uh, yes. they said that Australia accepts only fair-skinned people for immigration. If you're fair-skinned, yeah. you're allowed there. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's shameful. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. Being so dark myself, I just wondered, why would anybody want to go to a country which discriminates against one because of color? Yeah. Yeah, you don't yeah. see the qualifications or anything else, but it was ongoing. Yeah. And as for Anglo Indians assimilating, yes, some did assimilate, but uh, there were many others. I worked as an editor with Oxford University Press, and uh, yes. the head uh, at that time was uh, an Anglo Indian, Neil O'Brien. I think he's uh, Derek O'Brien's father, if you know him from TMC. Uh, yeah. So very smart, very knowledgeable gentleman, but they definitely had a very superior air about them. So I don't think it went anywhere, you know. Mm -hmm. Some of them may have assimilated very well, but there was quite a large number of them, particularly in Kolkata, who I don't think assimilated that well. But yeah, then, yeah, there yeah. are exceptions everywhere to everything. Yeah, I think, you know, in my subconscious, uh, you know, in my sub subconscious writing mind, um, I wrote May as somebody who was above all of that, you know, who, have, yeah. who was her own woman. Yeah. Uh, and I, I mean, I didn't do it deliberately. It's, all, all this I'm saying is only, you know, looking back at it. Um, that I, I wrote her as as an Anglo Indian woman who was confident, she was confident of being Indian, mm. you know, and, and happy to be just Indian, not, and not to be accepting, Anglo Indian. Accepting of her situation that, well, you know, she is an yeah. Anglo Indian, but uh, she's no different from anybody else. But mm. I think one of the things that really I really enjoyed was the fact that they found Rose. To me, the whole <laughs> book just came together at that point. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. must congratulate you for putting that Thank in. You. Touch in without any elaboration. Thank that you very much. Wonderful. Thanks, Thanks for that. Lovely, pleasant. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was a good Bollywood ending to the novel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another thing, uh, Kaveri, I had, uh, Manu, I had one, one observation is about the tribals. Yes. I mean, I was not even aware that there were tribals, although I stay in Bangalore and have visited Kurg and, you know, the. Yeah surrounding areas and you know uh, yes and also you know from OT downwards I have yeah yeah uh, I never knew there were tribals in this area oh my god there, and you know I I was particularly oh struck, any struck, number yeah particularly struck by um the, the plight of the tribal people in, in all of India because you know wherever tribals are but just some strange coincidence or whatever you might want to call it is you know a, a stroke of bad luck um, that they their lands are where there's the most amount of minerals most amount of you know logging uh, possibilities mining and they have no voice to this day today you know when you know politicians have uh, you know own mining rights own mining lands uh, you know there's they're sitting they're sitting ducks, really. They have no voice at all, and um, you know, it is it is the it's such a tragedy. If I it's like the Indians of America. It's like yeah. the Indians in America. I just want to say that the tribals have those resources because they've looked after them. Yes, absolutely. They have the sacred right. groves yes, where yeah. you cannot yeah. touch the forest. 
yeah, yeah. And they know how to live sustainably. That's why their uh, areas are preserved. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That yeah. They just and have... Rajiv, yes. And Rajiv, there are a lot of them in Kurg. You have missed yes. them. Yes, yes. Oda yes. and, and others are there. No? In fact, all the Toda jewelry, Toda crafts, you know, they do such lovely handwork. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a store also, Rajiv, when you yeah. next go to Uti, Uttak Mandalam, you can visit the stall also. Definitely. And the green Kurubas, you know, the, who extract the honey. They're like, a lot yeah. of tribes still left, and they all are protected uh, here in India, like, especially yeah. in all the world, like a reserve here. We have a lot of uh, tribal people. You know, why, so, while I was in the tea gardens, I worked with a lot of tribal people from yes. Uta, yeah. Jharkhand, you know, and I understand, but I never knew that this part of uh, uh, the country also had tribes. I mean, yes. Yeah. And actually, I, you know, I've caught, I've named the particular tribe the Yurubas, uh, and that's that's a fictitious name. I, I combined the name of two tribes, you know, and made them made just make made it fictitious because, you know, there's always a chance when you when you're writing about an actual tribe that somebody might then turn around and say, but you know what, that particular tribe they don't they don't eat X flour or they only drink X water, you know. So I I didn't want any of that. So I I just I made it fictitious, but um, you know the. the very closely based on on the todas very mm. closely based on the yeah uh, anybody else would like i want to ask a question else? can you hear me i'm tammy hello yeah, yeah. Hi, hi. Yeah. Can he, can he, yes, uh, yeah, yeah yeah i had recently gone to uti though i've been there many a time but I had this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, strange, uh, you know, uh, 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 interest to go and see the stone house that was built uh, by an Englishman who first ventured to the Nilgiris and cleared that area. And that's yes. how Oti yeah. itself was created. Yes, it's a beautiful right. yeah. place. I don't yeah. know the uh, cons and pros and cons of that building there or whatever, but it was really great to see it. And only sad mm. thing was the government has put it as a government museum means of, you know, uh, yeah, appreciating the wonderful uh, architecture of that building. To the, anyway, it's a yeah. good revelation. And of course, uh, Uti has uh, its own tribals, uh, the um, Todas and the Badgas. My mother, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. I would wish to say, when after she finished her SSLC, those days, that was in 54, 55, uh, she worked with the... Um, Todas and Bargas as a social worker after she yeah. finished her schooling and she used to go and help them, you know, educate them. So maybe a little bit of connection there with the yeah, Todas. And, uh, yeah. And uh, in Kurg also, I had gone to this one person called Honey King. Uh, he was the first one, I think, to start a, a homestay in uh, near Madikeri, I don't know exactly that place. And uh, I saw a lot of tribals working there in this estate. And uh, I, I was uh, quite amazed because they resemble the aborigines in Australia. And yeah. um, being a biologist, I linked them because I felt that, you know, uh, according to the genomic studies and other things, uh, people have found that man has walked all the way from Africa and one yeah, of the paths yeah. went through South India and to Australia via Fiji and all that. So maybe yeah. these uh, these genetically, they are all connected to the aborigines in Australia. Yeah. They should be. And I was so struck by their similarities. You know, yes. was just I wanted to think. And uh, I think Indian uh, government should, I think, uh, go full scale uh, to save the remaining people yeah. and give yeah. them their original uh, you know, environment and learn from them how to save the environment rather than keep building stupid things and building yeah, all yeah, the but I think, you know, the, there's so much a vested interest when, you know, politicians are also the yeah. mine owners, politicians yeah. are also the logging companies. You know, it's, it's, there's so much a vested interest. But it's really, we feel bad because when we read, when we hear, as Sita was telling about the American uh, Indians, yes. and they have made, kept one small place as a museum in Canada and maybe in America, I find we have so much such kind of people when and we without nobody's bothered. I think yes. it's high time we should worry about all these tribals and preserve them, uh, give them chance to preserve their uh, at least the Andaman Nicobar they are saving 
the government is strict and doesn't yeah. allow them. Yeah. But, but see, uh, the, the, the thing with Andaman and Nicobar is that, you know, it, it is of military importance. So it's very yeah. easy to save something when it's of military importance. Yeah, of course. And a lot of, uh, uh, yeah. lots of intriguing st stuff going on there. We don't know, but yeah. yeah, as an onlooker, we can only comment uh, at yeah. most yeah. and say that, you know, do something about it. Maybe your next book should look at tribal, <laughs> uh, tribal. Well, uh, my next book is actually yeah, preservation. My next book is fully based in India. I mean, fully based in Ireland. Okay. Um, but the book after that is going to be fully based again back in India. Oh, uh, nice. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah, I have. I have a Did question for Kaveri. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Who is that? Yes. My mother. Kaveri, please take a question. I have a question for Kaveri. Arjun, Kaveri, before I go to everybody, let me introduce Arjun. Arjun is a general from the army and he oh. is also a writer. He recently written a book called uh, How the Wind Blew. And there he writes about the Indian expedition with the LGT in Sri Lanka. It's a very lovely book and he's written, beautifully he has written it. So Arjun Muttana is also a writer. And oh. he's collected thank, gathered thank, stories. Uh, thank you, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to make a small correction. Uh, I have, in this case, I have only sort of compiled it, though I have contributed a few articles myself. It's basically about the uh, personal experiences or accounts of our soldiers, officers, who served with the Indian peacekeeping force in Sri Lanka. Anyway, I, I think yes. today's talk is about Kaveri. I'd like to focus on that. Kaveri, you, you did mention that you spent a lot of time on research. Uh, a query here is... I. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, more uh, commercial writers uh, seem to have research teams or they seem to be hiring professional <laughs> researchers who help who help them with that. Uh, could you throw some light on how that works or is it worth it or not? Yeah. So, uh, hi, Arjun. It's lovely to, lovely to meet you with you here on this uh, forum. Um, just, just before I answer your question, just quickly to say that, you know, one of the reasons I was able to write this book is because I am a Fauji kid myself. You know, my father was in the army. I've grown up in, in garrison towns. I've grown up in cantonments. So, uh, you know, the army life is in my soul, really. So it, was, it, wasn't, very, it wasn't very difficult to write, uh, you know, to, to write about, um, you know, military, a military-based story. But to answer your question, um, you know, I mean, I can't imagine any, getting anybody to do my research for me because, you know, when you're researching something, you you expect as a writer for it to seep into your head, you know, so that the writing then, um, you know, you can paint, you, you, you have a picture in your head then, you know, you, in, in your mind's eye, you can see it. So, for example, when I wrote that Shikar scene, I could see it in my mind's eye because I, oh, that's all I did for six months was read about Shikars. But I think, you know, with, with the more, uh, with some of the very famous writers who, who employ research teams or, or, or a few researchers, it's actually more about, about fact checking. And I mean, I would have loved to have a fact checker and not have to do it myself. Uh, and I think there's a difference between, you know, doing your own research and just getting somebody to fact check. So, I don't know if that even answers your question, Arjun. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kaveri. I think uh, you answered my question. Thank you so much. Any, anybody else? Any question? If I give her my last question, anybody else wants to say anything? Yes, of course. I mean, being an NRI, when we came back to India, we always said Babka Raj hai. <laughs> that is what Ronnie said when he came back to India. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it's, it's funny, the, that one that one line, you know, uh, so many people in Ireland have asked me, what does it actually mean? I and mean, like, how do you even translate? Like, how can you even translate that Babkaraj? I mean, you just can't. I know. It's so, it's so <laughs> hard to translate it, you know. Yes, <laughs> Babkaraj. I, I go I into convoluted explanations of, you know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and Bob Kamal or something. <laughs> I know Bob Kamal. Sorry, Kamali, I didn't but... hear that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't hear that. Kamal. Kamal, sorry. Bob Kamal. Yeah, he's yeah. <laughs> <Bob Kamal. laughs> very lazy and he doesn't want to really work hard for yeah. anything. I want to marry his God, Bob Kamal, though. He doesn't have to work. <laughs> Born with a silver spoon. <laughs> 
Pravati, yeah. I wanted to ask you, when you write and publish a book, are there specialists who do the covers for them? What about the, your cover page? Do I, I mean, you give them the, 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 the feel of the story yeah. and then they design the cover, is it? Yeah. Arjun so has actually, also uh, got a good cover on his book. Yeah. So I, I actually, I'm, I'm delighted you asked me that question, uh, Shirwanti, because um, the, the cover of this book was so special for me because the, the cover designer was a name called, uh, a man called James Nunn. And uh, he's got a, you know, he's got a reputable um, book designer. And when he was looking, initially started looking for ideas for the book, you know, he was looking at, ref, you know, just visual references for the 1920s. And, uh, you know, this, uh, and I'll actually, I'll send, I'll send it on to Banu and maybe she might show it to you guys later on. The uh, book is very closely based on a matchbox label from the 1920s. Oh, is that so? You know, oh. so for me, it was like really, really, I, I was just so thrilled that, you know, it was so As closely you collect related. Matchbox covers. Sorry? You used to collect matchbox covers when you were children. <laughs> yeah, yeah but, true. Um, I have collected lots of them. And we yeah, used to uh, yeah. barter them for doubles and triples. Manu, <laughs> uh, may I ask a question? Sure, sure. sure uh, Kaveri, how much did your editor alter your writing? I just like to know yeah. her role in the book. Yeah. So uh, this editor I work with, I really trust her completely. She edits, she's edited. This is the third book of mine that she's edited. And I, I actually can't imagine uh, not having, uh, I can't imagine having anybody else edit my book because she, I mean, she actually, <laughs> she, uh, she believed so much in the characters that, you know, she would bring me and say stuff like, oh, I, I've just had, I've had a dinner that even Ishwar would be proud of, or, you know, I mean, and I, I would have to remind her, you know, Joan, those people are not real, and she said, but they're real for me, you know. So to answer your question, she, the way, it was very interesting. I had actually written the book. Uh, you know how the book at the moment, the, the book as it is, is divided into the 1920s and then the second part is the 1980s. When I gave my manuscript to the publisher, it was actually every alternate chapter was, you know, 1920, 1980, 1920, uh, 1980. Okay. Yeah. And uh, she suggested, you know, actually my mother was the first person to read my book. And my mom said to me, every time I moved time periods, I had to go back and read you know, like where, what then. happened, you know. So funnily enough, uh, that the, said that to yeah, the editor said the he same said thing, you know, she <laughs> said, why, why don't, why do you want to make it difficult for your reader? You know, make it easy for the reader. You know, let's club all the, the chapters in the 20s together and the chapters in the 80s together. And that's exactly what happened. You know, we just literally cut and pasted all the 20s chapters together and the 80s chapters together. And apart from that, there was no changes. So, you know, I was delighted. I was so delighted that that only change was, was in that. And I think it really made a lot of sense, you know, instead of making the readers struggle, you know, hopping from one time period to another. Uh, I think it worked out for the, for the best. She's a brilliant editor. I just absolutely, I owe her everything. Did she change your text at all? Words and things, sentences, title? No, and no, not all. No, not at all. I mean, there was, there was obviously, I, I gave them a hundred and, a hundred and forty thousand word manuscript. They asked me to cut it down to 110. Okay. So I came back, I went back to them with 120 and then we compromised on 115. Okay. okay. So, no. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, no, nothing was changed, but I was so thrilled, you know. No, I know because uh, I just wanted to know how she worked with you, you know, as an editor, because she has to be yeah. the reader. She has to pictureize the reader yeah. as well as the author. So she has exactly. to, yeah. you know, do both. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in several places now, she would have said to me, "Oh, you know, that's a little confusing. You know, could you elaborate?" Or yeah. she would say, "You know, that's an Indian word." Uh, you know, within the next few sentences, can you make sure that, you know, any, anybody reading the West can understand what it is. So, you know, stuff like that. So, but there was no, there was no major change in the story or anything. That, that, that stayed. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.
Okay, my, my, I come to my last question. Actually, it's not very, it's not directly relevant to the book, uh, but I can't help asking this. You know, there were so many Anglo-Indians in our times who made it very good back in England, you know, uh, when we were all growing up, like Cliff Richard, Engelbert Humperdinck, yes. Merle Oberon, they were all famous Anglo-Indians of our times. Now, if they were tainted, I want to know, how did they go up there, back to their, to England, and they became famous in spite of being, they didn't face any racism or biases or anything. In spite of being tainted Anglo-Indians, they made it good. Yeah. Well, no, they are not Anglo-Indians. Oh, they are. They are. No, 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 they were born in India, that's all. They were Britishers. Uh, is that so? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They were all okay. of the British parents, officers, the British children. The army, yeah, wherever, yeah. in Madras, Lucknow, wherever, yeah. Delhi. I th I th so they are not Anglo Indians. The Anglo Indians have taken them as their leaders, that's all. Oh, they, that, they, that's they are not Anglo Indians. Yeah. They were British. I mean, some of, some, British. some of them no, were I think, Anglo Indians. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry, but I think Merle O'Brien was in Calcutta. And she was born here. Early part of her childhood was in India, but they were in a different time zone. And Cliff Richard also was born in Lucknow or somewhere else. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Lucknow. He moved on in a very at a very young age to uh, UK. So that's true. Their growing years were in the UK, so they were very British in their upbringing and character. And because of their talent, I think they got accepted. Similarly, our Joanna Lumley. She was born in Kashmir or somewhere. Yeah. I think from yeah, from from what what I researched, uh, you know, several people uh, who who made it successfully, you know, even 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 though they weren't, uh, they may not have been celebrities, but you know, people who just made, you know, mm. became good businessmen or you know, well well known in their own sphere. Uh, a lot of them actually hid their identities, and a lot of them didn't. So it was just luck of the draw, really. You know, if they were very fair, they might have. I mean, color of the skin had a lot to do with it, but yeah. so um, you know, some of them hid it and some of them didn't, <clears throat> and and some of them didn't make much of it. You know, they they wouldn't have, they never denied it, but they never kind of said, "Oh, I'm Anglo Indian." You know, if somebody asked them, they might have agreed, "Yes, I'm Anglo Indian," or oh, "I'm from mixed birth." You know. Mm -hmm. That's why they always <laughs> made a joke that ah, uh -huh, you know, got mixed birth. Mean that mean they were very mischievous when they were teenagers. <laughs> That's how the mixed. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I can't hear you very well. So, yeah. there are always family oh. conversations. Yeah. Uh, all the elders they said, "Ah, this girl has some mischievous connection. That is why this baby is born fair." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Soldiers. You know, they... Any questions? Any questions? Well, that was a big thing in my grandmother's time. I think now, thank God, it's waning out but at that time yes there was a lot of fair and dark and brown you know there's a lot of uh, discussion happening always the child is born okay banu any more questions banu? even getting accommodation in uh, lodgings in england was very difficult in the 60s because of my complexion Sorry, I, mean, I can't actually hear you at all. I, I was trying to connect that getting accommodation in England in the 60s was very difficult because of my complexion. Oh. Sorry, Banu, can you, can you hear and tell me what uh, Anil asked? Uh, no, I think he said uh, when, he, when he, in the 60s, when he went to England, he found it very difficult to get accommodation because of his color. Is that right? Is that yes, right? yes. That's the question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So which means that kind yeah, of I mean, you know, Irish yeah. Irish people had the same Irish people had the same bias uh, when they went to the UK in the sixties and seventies. You know, it was very common to have a sign outside any establishment saying no in, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. That was very very common. Yeah, yeah. and Irish people haven't forgotten that. Mm -hmm. Okay, to 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 those who have read the book. Did the chaplain make any impact on any of you? The, cha the garrison chaplain? That is the Just, just the the one, one impact, and that is that when uh, Michael Flaherty uh, dirties his pants, he insists that he should be changed and uh, given clean clothes. To me, yes. he upheld his dignity as he was dying. 
So that yeah. made a difference to me. Yeah. And actually, Bandana, that, uh, you know, he, the priest is really one of my favorite characters in the book. Uh, I never intended him for him to have such a big role in the story. Uh, that's yeah, a big role. In it just evolved, you know, it just evolved. That, that story, his role in it just became bigger and bigger and bigger. And only towards the end, I realized that I liked him, you know, not, not towards the end, but after the book was published, you know, when I reread the whole book myself. I realized that uh, I liked him so much that I, I fed him from the moment he appeared till the moment he died. I fed him all my own favorite food you know, right through the book. And you know, and you sometimes you don't, you can't even imagine that your subconscious is kind of saying, oh, I like this guy, you know, I keep feeding him, you know, with whatever, all the stuff I like. He died on 15th August, 1947. Yes. I mean, yes. malaria. That I thought was he died scary. of malaria. In fact, Kaab, I think this would make a very good Netflix film. Please write a script and sell it to Jesus. Father, you won't believe I was saying the same thing. When Rajesh said I will translate a book, I think okay, there's a Hindi movie. Yes. England. But yeah, I, mean, I would love for it to be made into a film. I would. It would be my dream. And and, uh, actors, Indian actors, you know, uh, very yeah. good. I yeah. think it would be a very good Netflix serial of, say, 10 episodes or something like that. <laughs> Okay, if, if nice. that happens, Banu, the entire the entire Silver Surfers book club is coming for the premiere. Okay. Oh yes, and if it, if the premiere in uh, London, we we'll fly us all there. We'll all be there. <laughs> That's a promise. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's a dream. Yeah. Hope it comes true. Yeah, yes, yeah. Well, yeah. That's also you had to work at it, right? You had to work at it to yes, make it come true. To say, or we wind up. Is it? Uh, okay. Sorry, Banu, I can't hear Uma at all. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, premier shows, naturally, it has to be all mixed colors. It can't be just Irish, just Indians. Maybe some tribals also, if they allow us into their tribal land. Yes. <laughs> In the and some they gods also. They didn't allow And some them. gods also. Ashok, you want to wind up, please? Yeah. Sorry? Anybody want please? to wind up? You want yeah. to wind up for us? Yes, I want to wind oh, okay. up. Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, I think Shall yeah. we close? Uh, I would like to give a word of thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If there are no more questions. Okay. Okay. Well, I think uh, there were a lot of questions, and I think the session was so interesting, enjoyable, engaging, and a lot of interaction. It was wonderful to see that from the book club members and the non book club members. Thank you. To me personally, I always had this uh, image of Anglo-Indians as a very fun-loving, uh, you know, zest for life, that kind of you know, that image in my mind, right from my school days in a convent. And then I had a Anglo-Indian secretary for many years, this is Hazel Hadfield. And she gave me some insights into their kind of life. Eventually, she emigrated to UK. But they were a class apart, particularly the very fair, good looking, blue eyed, you know, those ones. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> in the old days, I think they also dressed very white, you know, in the sense, yeah. skirts yeah. and things like that. Of course, later on, by the time it was 80s and 90s, they moved on to saris. But I think they stood apart. So it's my, uh, I'm very, very happy to have the pleasure of thanking Kaveri for this wonderful experience that we've had today to be there. And I think I was told by Banu that you are in Budapest or something. <laughs> I am actually, yes. Very nice of you. <laughs> so, not at all, not at all. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for finding the time and uh, engaging with all of us. We had a wonderful time with a lot of lovely questions. And I'm sure that it has been a very, very informative and a very productive meeting. We look forward to many more like this. I would like to thank all our book club members, non-book club members, Silver Surfers, and of course, Banu and Sita for leading this on. And of course, our chief boss lady, Deepti. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you everyone and good night.
One last word is that uh, after uh, the movie called Julie, I think you all remember, which highlighted the Anglo Indian yes, yes. family. Your book should yes. now come as a movie. So it will be very nice. <laughs> could, I, could I just... Yeah, could I just add to that list? Like, if you're if you're interested in what I wrote, please read, um, please see the movie if you haven't seen it, Bhavani Junction. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and one other it. one other book, uh, one other film which you will love. It's called Bo Barracks Forever. Okay. Oh. Yes. And Kaveri, yeah, Kaveri, I forgot to mention. You, you know, you talk about the Conevera Hotel, the music, yes. the band it brought back a lot of memories of my stay in Chennai. And when Kaveri yeah. and when Paravara Hotel was pretty active. <laughs> yeah, I had a bar and yeah. one of my questions. Yes. You know that uh, most of us relate to it because we all lived in Madras about yeah. And also, yeah, wow. yes, not that. You mentioned the song Ging Bang Guli Guli Guli. Remember that? I had forgotten about it for 50 years now. Suddenly it comes in her book and I the whole song just came back to me, Kaveri. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, is it yeah. a well, I thought it was English liberation, no? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> is it a that uh ging gang bully 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 macha? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it an Irish song? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's it's a scouting song. You know, it, it's from the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts. Okay. It's a scouting song. Yeah. But, yeah. but of English origin. Is but it? universal, it's a universal song, yeah. Oh, you know, I, I felt a bit intrigued me. I said, I, we used to sing it in school. I know, I know, <laughs> I know, so did I. I read it in the book. That was such a lovely surprise. <laughs> anyway. Well, thank you all okay. so much. Bye. I can't tell you how yeah. much Thanks I appreciate you. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Vinny. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank, awesome. thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. For including me. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sita, for putting me in. Thank you. Companion, yeah. yeah. a lovely bunch of flowers, and since it is TGIF today, I love this Irish cream. Irish belly. Yeah. <laughs> Irish cream. Irish belly. Yeah. <laughs> you have yours there. Really it's a nice recipe. You. And there's yeah. a good recipe for a Irish, Irish belly curry. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is what well, we do. Thanks. Everyone, that was a fantastic Bye. session. Thank you. Bye. 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 Have a nice time. Thanks, 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 Manu and Sita, for doing such a phenomenal job at your first shot. You guys are now going to post more such good meetings and training sessions. Thank <laughs> Thanks, everyone, Bye. for joining Bye. in. Bye. Oh, thank, thank you. Book you. To Bye. 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 Bye, darling. Bye, thank sweetie. You. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. bye bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. bye. Yes, Dipti. Do you have anything to say, Dipti? <laughs> I'm missing you, Sita. <laughs> I'm, missing. I'm kissing you. I'm sending you kisses, Dipti. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm hey, back. You. Come on, let's have a party. Let's have a you must come over party. for the Women's Day party. When come is over it? for Women's Day. 9th of March, 8th of March. International I'm on, Women's I'm Day. On. Hey, let's hold a Women's Day get together. 8th of March. Hey, are you having one at home? Uh, hey, you want to come home? Yes, if you come home, definitely yes. <laughs> no, then let's have a Women's Day get together. I forgot about 8th of March. Hi, Meena. How are you? Oh. She's Mina, frozen. Mina is muted. Mina She's is muted. Frozen. Yeah. Nice. Let's do a Women's Day get together. We fun. Sure. Yeah. Nah. Sure, Bripti. It was so good, you guys. Bye. So awesome. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Dipti. Thanks for everything, Dipti. Thanks for giving us that extra time. We could not have managed in one hour. No worries. It wasn't about me at all. It's about the audience oh. always. <laughs> but everyone so that's excellent. Is, is, is Satish still with us? Satish no. is on you. Okay, take care. I'm gonna end the session take now. Body. You take care. Bye. You too, guys. And give my love to Manish. Say hi to Manish. Okay. And to Benji. Done. Take care. Bye. Bye.
Bye, sweetie.